So welcome um, to everyone. My name is Christine Larson, and uh, uh, thank you for coming to our short course on GNSS interferometric reflectometry. Um, I hope you've had a chance to look over the schedule. Um, today, it's really going to be just me and Felipe Nowinski uh, talking about both the theory and the practice of GNSS IR. So he's going to start out giving you a, a nice overview of how this all works or why it works. And um, then we'll take a break. And then I'm going to talk about the software. So it's mostly screenshots where I'll show you how the code works, but I'll try to give you some insight about why the code is the way it is. Um, um, and then I hope that you've also seen that tomorrow we're talking about snow and soil moisture. The following day, we're going to do all things water, lakes, rivers, the oceans, tides. And then the last day, there are a lot of different topics, including how to pick a good site, how to evaluate your own sites, how to use cheap sensors and, and things like that. We have some other guest speakers uh, there as well. I hope you can see the current guest speakers here um, that have come today to help. I wanna thank them all because they're really all volunteering their time for this effort. So I really do appreciate that. So uh, I think with no further ado, uh, I will uh, introduce our first speaker, Felipe Novinsky, professor. Uh, in Brazil, and I will not get the name right. I apologize, Felipe, I didn't memorize it. Um, he was my graduate student in um, Colorado, and I'm very, very proud of him. He's done, he did wonderful work as a graduate student, and he's doing wonderful work now. And um, <clears throat> he's going to start off with theory. So, Felipe. Okay, good. Well, so, um, hello, everyone. Thank you, Christine, for the introduction. Um, good morning, good afternoon, good evening for wherever you are. I will be covering some of the basic theory. So I will not uh, uh, talk a lot about applications. We'll see more of that uh, in the coming days. And I'll be basically following this encyclopedia chapter. So you can download from uh, ResearchGate and it has all the equations and details, okay? Um, I will start with uh, some context. I, I don't know how much uh, background you guys have in geodesy and uh, GNSS in general. So I'll just uh, remind you of some of the key concepts. And I will go over the principles of uh, GNSS IR. And then uh, we'll show you with some more details, the geometry and the physics behind it. And I will wrap up with uh, a few slides about the data fitting. How do we um, fit an empirical model to the uh, field data? <clears throat> So um, the, the GPS, the GLONASS, Galileo, and Beidou systems, they are in medium Earth orbit. So that puts it at about 20,000 kilometers altitude. And that's important for us because it dictates how much time a satellite will stay in the sky visible. Um, if you have seen some of the... Uh, um, satellites that you can see with the naked eye just after sunset or before sunrise, like the International Space Station, you know it's really fast. In a couple of minutes, it goes away. Uh, GNSS satellites, they are slower. They keep up on, uh, for a, about one hour or more uh, for rising and then one hour more for setting in the sky. And, and another important characteristic of the, uh, the orbital constellations is the orbital plane inclination, which is about a 55 degree with respect to the equatorial plane. And that's important because it leaves a hole in the northern and the southern poles. And we'll see that the consequences of that in terms of the reflection footprint in a bit. Um, 
when when this was all started uh, a few decades ago, we only had the GPS and GLONASS satellites. Nowadays, you are lucky enough to have more than 100 satellites available for GMSSIR. So that's really exciting because uh, each satellite has the potential to give you one more water level retrieval, for example, if you're doing tides. So it, we're really fortunate to have this many satellites available and for free. Um, if, if we plot the sky tracks, the, they would look different depending on your latitude. If you are uh, sitting on the North Pole, the, the polar hole would be right above your head, so at zenith on the left-hand side here. Uh, you would never see a satellite uh, above a 55 degree elevation angle. And throughout this course, we'll be talking a lot about elevation angles, which is zero at the horizon and 90 degrees uh, at the zenith. Um, now, if you, if you move to a mid-latitude, you will see the, the polar hole shifting. It's no longer at zenith. It's now uh, closer to the nearest uh, geographical pole. For, so for a northern station, it's it's due north. And, and then we'll be talking about azimuths. Uh, remember, it goes from zero to 360, and you can do negative azimuth. It's, it's a circular quantity. Now, if you are in a, in a station by the equator, zero degree latitude, you see the two halves of the polar hole, one in each uh, geographical pole. Okay, so you'll see a little bit in the north and a little bit in the south. And the sky tracks, they will be crossing from south to north or north to south, but primarily in a meridian, uh, uh, parallel to the meridian, okay? Compare that to the polar station in which you have long arcs. So that, that will dictate where you are going to get the reflections, if it's going to come from the water that you are interested in measuring the level of, or, or the soil that you want to avoid. And also keep in mind these satellites, they, they rise like the sun, it stays up for couple of hours and then eventually it, it sets again. So every time it, it, it crosses the horizon, we can do a, an altimeter retrieval or soil moisture or whatever you were interested. Um, we, we have some uh, uh, geostationary satellites that broadcast uh, signals like similar to the, to the NEO satellites, but the geo, they cannot be used for a reflectometry because they, they do not change their position in the sky. And we do need them to be moving, especially in terms of elevation angle. The ideal track, it would be a totally radial track with the no azimuthal variation, just going straight up from horizon to zenith. Okay, so this is a bit the actual tracks, they complicate a bit the analysis, but keep in mind you have to apply a mask to separate the good from the bad tracks. These satellites, they transmit a radio wave. Um, it is in the L band, about 20 centimeters wavelength. And that's important to keep in mind because it dictates the scale of the reflectors that matter. So anything much smaller than that, we will not be able to see. Um, each satellite, it, it transmits multiple carriers in slightly different frequencies, 
L1, L2, L5, all in the same band. So it's about 20, 24, 25 centimeters. So it's it's not it's not like optical with a tiny wavelengths. It's also not like um, very high frequencies. So we are in this uh, decimeter level of band. And also the polarization matters. It's uh, it's circular and and it's it's right handed and. That, that's important because when we get a reflection of the water or land, we'll get uh, actually two reflections, one in the same polarization, right-handed, and another one in the opposite polarization, which is left-handed. And the proportion between the two will depend on the elevation angle and also on the material properties of the surface. Let me see how I am on time. Okay. Um, sometimes you see the expression GNSS remote sensing thrown out, and it's mostly for uh, atmospheric and ionospheric sensing. I, I mentioned this because reflectometry is a type of GNSS re remote sensing. Uh, but it's distinct because it's, instead of looking at the refraction of the radio waves in the propagation medium, we will be looking at the reflection of the same radio waves on the surfaces, especially the natural surfaces, land and water. Um, we are not so much interested in the in reflections from the built environment, like a. Um, uh, house, okay, um, and and these uh, atmospheric remote sensing applications they are also uh, relevant because especially in the space based configuration in which the not only the transmitter is is a satellite but also the receiver is a satellite. Um, sometimes we get reflections. The, um, the, the radio wave, it, it goes down so much that eventually touched down on Earth and you get a reflection. And for those uh, radio occultation applications, the reflection is bad. It's contamination. They usually discard those. But for us, it is the signal of interest. Um, I'm not seeing the chat, but if you have questions, feel free to type those in the Q&A and I will take them after I finish, please. Um, the the uh, GNSS reflectometry in general, it is designed to use uh, two antennas, one looking up and to get the direct transmission and another one looking down or to the side, sideways to get the reflection. And that requires obviously an additional antenna, but also a, a very special uh, receiver. It's not something that you can purchase uh, commercially, not easily at least. And it can work from uh, space and also from from airborne platforms. What we'll be uh, discussing in this course is the ground-based uh, variant of reflectometry, which we call GNSS interferometric reflectometry. And it is so-called because it tracks uh, a single channel per satellite. So the direct and the reflected radio waves, they are combined and we track the resulting multipath, the multiple paths. The first one is the direct, the second one is the reflection. We let them interfere with each other 
sometimes constructively, sometimes destructively. We do not attempt to separate them with uh, different antennas, for example, we let them combine and then we, we, we deal with it later in the data processing. Okay. And that has huge advantage because we can use commercial uh, receivers, even commercial antennas, even, the, even though they are designed to suppress the reflections for positioning, navigation, and timing applications, these reflections, they cause uh, shifts, errors in the uh, coordinates for your antenna. And that's, that's something to be avoided in geodesy, in navigation, in timing applications. But it is really our, our signal of interest. One thing that we require is for the station to be stationary. There are some studies uh, doing the Genesis IR on ships, but it's a lot more difficult. And, and for airborne platforms, is, is, it has not been proven yet. So if the station is stationary, we wait for the satellite to rise and then eventually to set. And as the satellite elevation angle increases and then decreases, we see the reflection drifting over the surface far away initially, and then closer to the antenna and then, and then uh, further again. We'll see that in more detail in a bit. And, and this is uh, for those of you who are doing your uh, literature reviews in your thesis or dissertations, there is a, a related technique that you can uh, study and, and, and borrow some concepts, which is other radar remote sensors. So GNSSR is a type of radar because it uses radio waves and it uses artificial radio waves. They are they are not naturally generated. They are they are generated by our instruments. So it is a type of radar. Um, and you you might have heard of radar altimetry, in which we get the for an airplane we get the the airplane altitude over the ground for safety landing. Uh, but for in, in satellite altimetry, we know the satellite position and we do radar altimetry to get the uh, mean sea level, for example. And it is, a, we call it monostatic because the transmitter and, and the receiver, they are co-located, they are in the same location and the, and the direction of incidence is vertical. Another uh, related technique is radar interferometry. I know you, you might have heard of the SRTM mission that mapped the Earth's topography uh, several years ago. It was all very exciting. Um, and it does with a bi-static configuration in which there is a separation between receiver and transmitter. And in GNSSR, we take that to the extreme. Uh, the transmitter is in orbit and the receiver is on Earth. But you can you can borrow some uh, theory from those techniques for for Genesis R, IR. Okay, so this is um, really uh, going from context to principles. The main observable or type of observation that we'll be using in this course is called signal to noise ratio. It is a measure of the received power. And this received power, it will fade over time. It will uh, increase and decrease as, as shown in this uh, plot. So if the satellite is rising, uh, 
Initially, we don't see it. It might be behind a mountain or a building. Eventually, the receiver starts tracking. And then we see an increase in power, then a, a decrease that's called a fade. So this fading pattern or interference pattern, it is attenuated. It's, it's a damped sinusoid, which is riding on top of a, a, a trend. Uh, well, you might remember from high school physics when the two uh, waves are aligned or in phase, they reinforce each other. When they are out of phase, they cancel each other. So that's basically what we see. The cancellation is not perfect because the two the intensities or the power is not the same. And in, in, the, in the general case, we have a, a, a vector sum of the direct uh, wave and the reflected wave. They both have, each of them has their own magnitude or the square of magnitude, the power. And they have a phase relationship, a rotation in the complex plane between them. And it is really this phase that drives the oscillations. Okay, we are measuring power, but we're really interested in the phase. Okay. So this phi term here, it is called in the interferometric phase. It is the reflection phase minus the direct phase. And it is the one responsible for the oscillations. Okay. The other uh, terms here, they are powers, direct power, reflected power. And if you divide, reflected by direct, you get the interferometric power, which isolates the, the surface re reflectivity, which, which is driven by the material that the surface is made of. The, uh, well, was, I'm not, I, I'm not going to get ahead of myself. We're going to see that in a bit. But keep in mind, as the satellite rises, we will see these oscillations and, and, and by fitting a, a curve to this, we can infer properties of the reflecting surface, such as the height of the antenna above the water, or if the antenna is fixed and the antenna is go and the water is going up and down with the tides, then we have a GNSS IR tide gauge. Okay. So this is, this is the most important slide that I have today for you is, is the interferometric delay. Um, let's start with the sim simplest case uh, for a satellite that is just uh, uh, right above your head at the zenith. The, the radio wave will come down to the antenna and that's the direct path. Then it will continue down to the surface bounce off the surface and go up uh, back to the antenna again. So the, the interferometric delay in this case will be simply two times the antenna height above the surface. Okay, that's, that's super easy. Um, if we have on the other hand, a satellite uh, setting on the horizon, so zero degree elevation angle, we have the direct and the reflected paths parallel to each other, and we'll have a zero uh, interferometric delay between them. I keep talking about delay. Normally, you would think this is in, in seconds or, or milliseconds, but we always multiply by the vacuum speed of light, so we express it a delay in meters, okay? So it's a propagation delay, or if you want, you can call it a propagation distance. Um, so that's the geometric part. And the, if all you want to do is, is, is tight gauge, then that's all you need, really. But if you want to do a soil moisture, then you have to care about the other terms in the interferometric phase. And these other terms, uh, we may call them the non-geometric phase term, 
it is really driven by the surface material composition, the antenna gain pattern, and the antenna phase pattern. We will see that in a moment. So the total interferometric phase will be the geometric part converted from meters to radians, and that the conversion factor is, is the wave number. Okay. And, and this other term, it will come from, from this complex interaction between the surface response and the antenna uh, radiation pattern. Um, all right, let's move on. The other quantity of interest is the interferometric power. Again, it's the ratio between reflected and direct power. The direct power, it's here in green. It will uh, decrease with decreasing elevation angle. And that's Maybe, driven- Felipe, just a question is, um, I'm only seeing half your slide. I mean, I'm only uh, seeing half the plot. For all of them or just- No, 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 just the one, that one, I'm not seeing any- the Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Okay. I, I had, I I had something. Okay. Sorry about that, yeah. I. There is a little red one that I tried to hit, but uh, I didn't do a, a good job here. Um, that's the interference pattern, but just focus on the, uh, uh, the direct power. It's going down with the elevation angle. Um, and that's because the antenna is designed to amplify signals, uh, to amplify signals coming from satellites uh, in this in the zenith direction, okay. The the antenna GNSS antennas they they want to suppress reflection as much as possible. Sometimes even if sometimes the antenna is more expensive than the receiver because they really want to to get rid of of multipath. Um, now the reflected power it is doing the opposite. It is increasing. And it does so because of the same reason, the antenna gain pattern it, it, near the horizon, it cannot separate very well the direct coming at a positive elevation angle and the reflection coming at a negative elevation angle. The gain pattern is, it, it, it has uh, uh, continuity. So it has to be similar for them. Um, and, and here in the dashed black line is the interferometric power, which is the ratio between them. So it tends to one, tends to unity at the horizon, which means uh, the, the reflected, reflected power is, is as strong as the direct power. All right. And that's why we see um, uh, oscillations with uh, uh, a larger amplitude near the horizon. So this is consequence of the antenna gain pattern and also consequence of the surface uh, reflection. If you tilt the antenna sideways, you'll see um, increased amplitude, but then you'll, you'll lose the back of the antenna. The, advent, the real advantage of keeping the antenna up, broken up, even for reflectometry applications, is that it's 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 symmetric around the azimuth, so we don't lose any quadrants. Okay, so uh, here I'm going to show you the uh, effect of uh, changing the antenna height or the reflector height if you if you want. Um, here we have an actual case of two GNSS antennas, one on a two meter pole and the other one on a five meter mast. Okay. And we'll see an effect on the, on the interference pattern in terms of the modulation frequency. The high, higher the antenna, the higher frequency in the modulation. Okay. We don't see an effect of the antenna height on the magnitude. Um, 
when you put the antenna on a higher uh, platform, you see further. So the reflection point will come from a, a, a greater distance from you. So that's good if you want to avoid some near field obstructions. If you cannot get too close to the water, for example, you just simply put the antenna higher up and then you can see further, further out. And you, you really don't want the antenna to be below, uh, too close to the surface, okay? Because then these oscillations, they will get uh, really low frequency and it will be hard to separate the oscillations from the antenna gain pattern. So five, five ish meter is kind of ideal for if you balance the, the logistics of installing the antenna and, and the signal processing benefits. Now, one uh, physical um, characteristic of the surface that matters for GNSS IR is the random roughness. And that's simply the height standard deviation. So if the water is calm, is smooth, then you get a mirror-like reflection or a specular reflection. Um, if on the other hand, you have winds blowing over the water, then the water gets rough. You have water waves and, and that scatters the radio wave uh, in, in all directions. So if you imagine the, the wave front coming really nice and clean, plain parallel down to the surface, here is for a satellite at Zenith, okay? Then it, it hits the surface and it, it bounces back up. And when it does so, it's no longer a plane wave. It's, it tends to be a plane wave, but it's, it, it mirrors the irregularities in the surface, over the surface, okay? So the wave front will no longer be uh, uh, coherent. So coherence is, is a, a very important requirement for GNSS IR. It simply does not work if you were in the surf zone with the uh, wave crests breaking. It, 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 it has some uh, uh, requirements for the surface smoothness. And that has to do, if you see this equation on the lower left corner, if uh, sigma h is the surface height standard deviation, sigma d is the uh, interferometric delay standard deviation. So there, there is this propagation. If you were looking uh, perpendicular to the surface, you see all the roughness. Now, if you are looking uh, sideways near grazing incidence, then you, you don't have as much an effect. And that's what this plot shows. For the same level of roughness, the amount of attenuation or dampening is, is, is a function of elevation angle. Okay, so that's yet another reason why GNSS IR works so well near the horizon. Yeah. Let me check my time. Okay. Um, the surface material for, for water level altimetry, we kind of uh, uh, pretend this doesn't matter. And because the geometric phase change is huge, so it dominates everything. But if you were doing soil moisture, then you have to start carrying it. Well, is the, is the surface a soil? What type of soil? Is it dry? Is it wet? Um, and here I made a comparison between more drastic cases, the dry and wet ground, but also fresh water and uh, a copper metal surface. And you see that it affects both the amplitude of the oscillations, but also the phase 
I'm not plotting the phase directly, I'm plotting the effect, the indirect effect of phase on the interference pattern. And that, that is, is represented by the shift left to right in the interference pattern. Okay, so if I keep the antenna height constant, but change the material from a metal to a water to ground, then we'll get a different interference pattern. All right. Uh, to, you can calculate this if you know the uh, medium permittivity. It is a, a complex quantity that has real and imaginary components. So it has always a magnitude and a phase. And this also uh, is responsible for uh, generating the two polarizations that I mentioned earlier in the presentation. So if a right-handed wave impinges on the surface, it generates both a right-handed and a left-handed. And the proportion between the two depends on the elevation angle and the material permittivity. All right. Um, I'm not showing here, but these two polarizations, they are captured by the antenna depending on, on the antenna model. So the, the antenna polarization is a very important uh, design characteristic. And if you use a navigation antenna, for example, a cheap $1 GPS antenna, then you have a, a, a mixture of the two polarizations. Whereas if you have an expensive geodetic quality antenna, you get mostly the right-handed reflections and a little bit of the left-handed too. All right, moving on. Uh, the, the satellite is up at a given elevation angle in the sky, the reflection will be coming from the same elevation angle, but negative. So it will, come in, will be coming from below. And, and this obeys Snell's law on the surface. So we, we pretend the radiation travels along a, a thin ray, an infinite, really thin infinitesimal ray. Um, but this ray, it's, it's really a fictitious concept. If you have a, an observer in a different uh, position for the same transmitting satellite, you get a different ray. So it's, it's not like the GPS satellite is shooting rays at you. They, they don't care about us. The GPS satellites, uh, they keep transmitting everywhere. They blanket the entire Earth with uh, radio waves. And these rays, they emerge from the observation geometry. So the azimuth will be the same as that of the satellite and the elevation angle will be the negative and the radial distance, the horizontal distance is age over tangent of E. So satellite high up at zenith will reflect at uh, nadir. And if the satellite is at the horizon, it will be coming from an infinite distance. Okay, so they will do these arcs on the ground. This is a map, east versus north. And here we have a, a, a mountain obstructing some of the reception. Okay, that's why it's not symmetric. Now, um, this. Uh, There's a picture of uh, a race is, 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 it works, okay? But it's not really what happens in reality. Um, in, in reality, the rays, they have a certain thickness and this thickness is given by, by the Fresnel zones. They are ellipsoidal regions in space and they are ellipses on the reflecting surface. You can calculate, they are related to the specular reflection point. The specular reflection point is not at the center of the Fresnel zone. It is at uh, the nearest focus of the lips. Um, and this can be roughly understood as that clearance requirement. So anything smaller than the, 
uh, Fresnel zone, you will not be able to get a nice and clean reflection. Um, and and you also want the the reflecting surface, for example, a river. The river cannot be too narrow. It has to fit the Fresnel zones and more. Um, and and also you you want the uh, the transition from water to land to be sort of gradual. You don't want it to be abrupt, like a river bank. If your Fresnel zone is, is, is crossing the river bank, then you don't get a reflection, you get a diffraction, a diffracted wave, because this uh, integration that would occur over the Fresnel zone, it got truncated, all right? Um, so keep your sur reflectant surface as large as possible. Um, and and the, the picture that I want you to keep in mind is if you consider the, the reflection delay over the surface, it will be minimum at the specular reflection point. So that's another definition of the specular reflection point. That, that's Fermat's uh, uh, principle, okay? All right, I have just a few more slides. And uh, when you look at the SNR data, you, you immediately recognize a trend. This trend in this case is just a, a, a linear polynomial a rectilinear polynomial, but it can be a low order polynomial like a quadratic. And you see the oscillations and that's what we are interested. So the, the oscillations, we make it fit in a, an empirical uh, sinusoidal model. It has an amplitude. This amplitude, if the arc is short enough, you can assume it's a constant amplitude. If it if you want to use a longer arc, you, you, you need to uh, allow for some dampening. But then it has a, a, a frequency, which is uh, essentially the antenna height above the surface. And it has a phase shift, okay, which is uh, driven by the soil moisture or the uh, water salinity and other characteristics. And, and really all we would be doing for, at least for altimetry, altimetry applications is counting oscillations. And you can do, I, I swear you can do altimetry by eye. You just count the number of oscillations. Here I'll do one, two, three, four, five, and maybe six, six full oscillations. Uh, multiply that by half of the wavelength, so, 20 centimeters divided by two. And then you divide this by the difference in the sine of elevation angle. So here we have about 20 degree, and here we have about maybe five degrees. And the difference in the, in the sine of elevation angles will be the denominator in your fraction. And voila, that's your water level. So everything we'll be doing is is out uh, is making this automatic, okay? But you can do really altimetry by eye. This is making it more formal. You take the full SNR, you detrend it, you remove the dampening, you get a nice and clean sinusoid. If you remember from your signal processing class, this is a a single uh, uh, tone. That's a uh, uh, a Dirac delta in the spectral domain. But uh, if you want to try different frequencies or different heights, then you'll get side lobes like this. So the periodograms is the esti estimate of the spectral distribution. It will have these side lobes. You'll be seeing a lot of this during this course. Um, now, one complex issue is the GNSS receiver, it keeps uh, 
recording data at regular intervals, like one second, if you're lucky, or 10 seconds or 30 seconds. But we do all the spectral analysis, not over time, in the time domain, we do over sign of elevation. So the, the data sequence is no longer regularly spaced. Okay, so the question is, how should you configure your GNSS receiver to sample these oscillations fin finally enough to be able to retrieve uh, reflector height? And that is obviously the Nyquist uh, uh, frequency. And this is uh, integrated in the, sim in the online app. You will give, you, you give the uh, approximate height and it will give you the, the sampling frequency that you need to configure your receiver. And that's, again, that's not your altimetry uh, retrieval frequency because we need to wait for the satellite to rise uh, during its course, okay? Now, this is just to, for you to get an idea of uh, how this empirical model, this sinusoid plus polynomial match everything that I told you before about the gain patterns, about the surface roughness, and about the surface reflectivity. And again, to focus on the altimetry applications, it's the last, the last uh, equation will be retrieving ge the geometric height, but there will be a small uh, height uh, component that is a consequence of the material composition, okay? So if the soil gets drier or wetter, it will appear as if the antenna height has changed, okay? All right, um, I guess I... I think the time is up. And Christine, I think I'll stop here. Um, there's a question about whether you can estimate snow properties um, from the direct signal. And I think the answer to that one is, yes, there are papers on doing that, but it's a different, it's not reflectometry. It's really looking at attenuation or bar in buried antennas anyway. Yeah, bar burying the antenna is an easy way to... <laughs> I mean, that's like baby, baby stuff. I shouldn't say things like that. I, that's been done. <laughs> and it, it, that's a nice big signal. Um, and that'll give you, um, it's a different, it's a different way of doing things. Um, uh, let me see. Um, somebody did ask me about the scale of the, uh, the roughness and, and, and it was on your legend, but most of right. yours or five, 10, 20 centimeters. Yes. Maybe he's just asking. It's, it's, he's it's of the scale of one. the wavelength, yeah. Yeah, which is about 20 centimeters. If, if you get a, a long, long wavelength, then uh, you, you start to see the, the entire soil going up or down, like downhill or uphill. And it's not, it's not uh, random roughness, it's, it's systematic, so. Um, somebody here was ask, asking about, um, basically, I think you're asking about tropospheric delays and does that affect uh, soil moisture using GNSSIR? And I'd say no. Um, we've talked about it, uh, doing a better job for that for the refraction for sea level, but that's a different problem than soil moisture. Um, and I'm going to probably, because I know how many slides are in my deck, <laughs> I'm going to stop the questions. Um, I'm a very um, unpracticed Zoom user, so I apologize if I share my screen incorrectly, but I'm going to go to advanced portion of the screen. And then you, uh, I thought you, uh, yeah, you go like that, and I hope it works. It probably doesn't, but let's try it. You guys will tell me. Can you see slides? Yes, I can see. I can see it. it says running the GNSSREFL code. 
Yay, can you see that? Yep. Uh, where did it come from? Yep. Oh, I'm very excited. Um, all right. Hello, everybody. Thank you for coming to the second hour. I'm going to talk about the practical aspects of what uh, Felipe talked about theoretically. Um, no, it doesn't. Okay. So where did it come from? Let me see if I can get this uh, thing off my screen. Um, basically, this software package you've come to learn about came out of a research group, a research product, pro project called PBO H2O, um, which uh, was an effort to use data from the Plate Boundary Observatory. So that's where the PBO came from. The Plate Boundary Observatory was built in the Western United States to measure plate tectonics, had nothing to do with uh, the environment, but Felipe Nowinski was uh, part of the group that turned the data into soil moisture, snow, and vegetation sensors. So this is 10 years ago. About everything was in Fortran. Uh, everything that related to getting data was a bunch of shell scripts um, and a lot of plain text files. So I would say it was very not modern, uh, certainly not the way someone would write a software package today. Uh, we did use MATLAB for the environmental models uh, that I'm talking about. Uh, we had a wonderful web pro programmer that made everything um, available for us, and, and so I didn't have to learn how to do any of that. Um, and we ran that until 2017, and we gave that code, uh, which ran on about 375 stations uh, to JPL. And uh, I put the translation codes for the uh, GPS data online. And um, I took a small part of that code, which had been ported to MATLAB, mostly for the cryosphere community uh, to use. But again, we gave our PBO H2O code to JPL, um, but th that was so that they could run it. Um, and we also took our reflection zone code and put that into MATLAB. So how is GNSS Reflex different from that effort? Well, um, and why, why did we do it? Um, I wanted to take the outcomes of that earlier work, which were very specific, one network, just GPS, um, and, you know, but it was written in Fortran and uh, it had, had Band-Aids all over it and uh, wasn't usable by the broader community. So we wanted to, or I wanted to make it more accessible to people. And so this code is an ancestor, if you will. It's a son or daughter of that original code. It's in Python, it's on GitHub. Uh, the Fortran is, has been hidden from you. Uh, obviously um, our work is, our previous work's quite old now. At that time, they only sold you receivers that tracked GPS satellites. But now, of course, if you buy a new receiver, you would never buy one that was just GPS. So our software is modern. We don't have shell scripts. We no longer make you pick up orbits or query for archives. We've put that in the code for you. Our, our original codes made you do all that extra work. It can read multiple kinds of GPS files and um, you're, if you're here uh, at this short course, I, I think you're interested in one of these three topics, which are soil moisture, snow accumulation, and water levels. Um, those are the ones being covered this week. Uh, we've also, uh, Tim, Tim put this together, uh, read the docs documentation style so that you can go online and get everything uh, that's up to date on the code. And um, Kelly and Tim have also made dockers and Jupyter Notebooks, which means that Docker's in particular is huge in that you don't have to have Linux running yourself and you don't have to install the Python. So uh, Felipe has gone through why this works and what kind of satellites and things about the constellations. I just wanna make sure that we're all on the same page that when I say H or reflector height, you know that this is my cartoon version of a GPS antenna. This is the antenna, this is the planar surface. I'm gonna call this thing we're estimating reflector height or H. 
And that, as Felipe has told you, this H can be extracted by the interference between the direct signal shown in blue and the reflected signal shown in red. Um, the footprint depends on H, and um, Felipe talked about why that was, and I'll give you a tool on how to, to do it, how to, to measure it. And as he said, it also depends on what kind of surface it is and also on how rough it is. Those are issues we have to accept and, and understand. So um, it's easy enough to say uh, you can do all these things with GNSSIR, but uh, the details can really get complicated. So I'm gonna try to explain to you um, what the software is doing and why we do it this way. Uh, so the basic steps are you need data, all right? So you can have your own data. We've had some people ask, yes, you can have your own data. But we have rules, uh, and we use the rules that GNSS archives use. And so that means you have to follow those rules. We've tried to say what they are. Um, you need orbits. Now, we've tried to make the orbits invisible to you, but that those are required, and we go get those for you. You don't tell us that you want multi-GNSS. We assume you only have GPS data. Um, and this is something that Felipe also talked about. You have to help the software know where the good regions are. This is particularly important if you're interested in doing tide gauge work. So um, you have to define that region. Now, he also mentioned the rising and setting satellite arcs. The code will do that for you once you've told it which regions, excuse me, you're interested in, but again, this is something the code is gonna to have to figure out. And then you're gonna look at the frequencies in the SNR data to tell you what the reflector height is. What's the dominant frequency? And from that, you get the reflector height. And you have to be sure, or you have to try pretty hard to make sure you believe those values. You need quality control. So we have, have some quality control. It can always be better, but we have some quality control metrics and that's what uh, one of the things we want to teach you about. And then usually you're trying to measure this over a long period of time, soil moisture for five years, say, or you wanna look at five snow years or you wanna measure tides for two years. So you have to do this over and over and over again uh, with your data. So let's go through these uh, steps. You need the data. Um, I don't know why that's like that. Okay, uh, this is when, you know, I wish this didn't have, huh. I was repeating this. All right, I'm gonna skip these because they don't make much sense. Uh, I apologize. Um, so uh, the, the steps that, we're talking about getting the data, you need the orbits, you need to repeat it, you need to be able to trust your results. I basically have three main um, software uh, blocks. RhinoX SNR translates the files, GPS files or GNSS files are generally stored as RhinoX is the name. Um, RhinoX, if you're familiar with it, uh, usually has carrier phase and pseudo range data in it. Uh, it also has SNR data if you ask for it or if your archive provides it. That's not enough to do reflectometry. You need to know the satellite azimuth and elevation angle. So that's another thing that the code does. Uh, quick look is a, a basically a visual feedback uh, code with the, that we wrote so that you would have some idea of what the good azimuths and elevation angles are. And then GNSSIR by itself is a module that does all the, the grunt work, if you will. It, it measures reflector heights over and over and over and over again for multiple days, for multiple satellites, for multiple frequencies. Um, this isn't a, just a one way. You would do these three steps, but then you say, does this make sense? Do the results look the way I expect them to look? You might go back, change your strategy a little bit, to improve the results, then you rerun everything. Now, once you think you've set up a good mask or a good azimuth and elevation angle um, settings, 
that's when you start doing science. So if you're here to learn about measuring snow depth, there's a separate module, okay, called snow depth. Uh, the soil moisture, the module is called VWC, volumetric water content. The water levels code is called sub daily. So it doesn't, it's not called water levels. Um, it can actually be used for any signal that has um, sub daily variations. Uh, so that's, that's how I see the code. There are three main modules. That's what I'm going to talk about today. Rhinox SNR, GNSSIR, and Quick Look. Tomorrow, we'll talk about snow depth and VWC. On Thursday, we'll learn about water levels. And then Friday, we'll put, pull it all together, talk about other things. So uh, if you haven't installed the code yet, this is just to remind you that uh, we use environment variables. And even if you don't know that you're using environment variables because you're using the Dockers or the Jupyter Notebooks, the code is, and you're gonna get some error messages that won't make sense to you if you don't know about that, or the documentation refers to these. So in particular, we're gonna expect the executables to be in a certain directory called exe. All your work is gonna be stored in an environment variable folder called reflect underscore code, and the orbits have their own home as well. Um, for the data themselves, again, if you're producing the data, you want to analyze your own data, you should use the naming conventions of the GNSS community. Uh, we use RINEX 2.11 and RINEX 3. Uh, you can use NMEA, which is a navigation format. Um, your file must have SNR data in it, and not all RINEX files do. And um, why do you need it? Because that's the only observable type that this code recognizes. We don't care about carrier phase data. We don't care about pseudo range data. If you wanna use those data, you need to go to a positioning software like Gypsy or Bernese or um, uh, our gamut. Your file must have coordinates in the header. And I've gotten many files from people that fail in our code because they don't have coordinates. And I understand why they don't have coordinates, that's fine. When you collect your own data, maybe it's not traditional to add coordinates by your uh, group, but we require it because we need that information to know what the satellite azimuth and elevation angles are. Um, and, you know, we have rules about the naming conventions just because it makes it easier to maintain the code. Um, and so we want generally the names to be lowercase uh, for the RINEX 2.11. I don't know why, but they're uppercase for RINEX 3. But we're following the conventions of the community. So, you know, it's weird, but the naming convention for GPS and GNSS files uh, don't recognize the full four years, like, you know, Four, four characters per year. They only use the last two characters, which is craziness, but there you go. So it's the name of the station, which is four characters uh, followed by the day of year, three characters, and then the year is after the dot. Um, we also allow Hadanaka compression. If you don't know what that is, that's fine. I'm not even gonna talk about RINEX3. I've been asked if you can use your own data, absolutely but you can't use crazy names. You have to use our naming convention and that's just that. Um, I would suggest starting out with the files that we know work. And then um, if you have problems with them, that's absolutely when we need to know if we've made mistakes in our, our documentation and so on. Um, so picking up the files, translating them, compute the angles, the main input, your own RINEX files, or the code will download them from a long list. Um, you only have to run that, this code once. You only translate the files once, typically. And the output is called a, an SNR file. Um, the defaults are GPS only, and these are the GPS frequencies, and the elevation angles below 30 degrees. Felipe is correct that you can see reflections at higher elevation angles sometimes, 
But in general, these are the elevation angles that have visible um, fringes uh, from natural surfaces like water, snow, and soil. Um, there is documentation um, for you to find out which are the archives that are supp supported, which orbits, and so on. I'm going to try to not show that now, but we'll see what happens. We have tried to make the number of required inputs very small, just three, the station name, the year, and the day of year. Uh, so for example, I've, this is what I would type on the command line, right next to SNR, station name, year, day of year. If the day of year is 10, you don't have to write 010. You can just say 10. But the file name will always have 010 in it because the file names require that the day of year be translated into three characters. And that's so the file names always have the same number of um, characters. So this code will translate your Rhinox file into this SNR format, which you don't have to know and don't have to read. And it'll store it in a directory with uh, the year in it, uh, SNR, because it's SNR data, station name, and then your file. So if you wanted to look at it for some reason, that's where it is. Um, I was going to try to show these, but I'm not sure if that's a good use of our time. But let's see if I shared my screen properly. You never know. Um, let's see. Let's go to Doc. Um, can somebody tell me whether you can see my my um, my? Can you see my screen? My um, yes. browser. Yes, we can see the Docker Docker screen. Okay, great. Um, so I just wanted to show you that you can look these things up. So this was actually thanks to Felipe. We have some quick links here that'll show you the main functions. And when you click on right next to SNR, and we're moving toward this, we have example calls. And then also um, here are all the possible parameters. The required ones are just the station, the year, the day of year. But we also have these other you know, if you want to know whether your orbits are supported, it's listed. If you want to know if your archive is supported, they're listed. Um, and we try to follow the rules for this read the docs documentation so that every time we um, change our code, the, the documentation gets updated. So that's the positive of that. So um, are you guys seeing my um, keynote now? Yes. Oh, yay. All right, so what's stored in the SNR file? Felipe showed you sort of the theory of what these fringes look like and so on. Um, this is what they actually look like on the x-axis is ours. The blue is the entire data set for one satellite pass. And in the red part is where that's what we want. Those are the data below elevation angle of 30 degrees. So the only things I care about are the satellite name, the time, elevation angle, and azimuth angle, and then what the power level is, which is what Felipe explained to you. So the power level is here for the SNR data, the SNR value. That's all we save. And we save that for every frequency that's observing at that time, and we store it in a file. Um, what does it mean in terms of hours? Well, and, and as, we, as Felipe said, the rising and setting arc, the rising arc is over here in black between hours two and three, and the settings is between seven and eight. Just as Felipe said, it's about an hour. Um, if you looked at that as a function of elevation angle, which he was showing to you is what the really important parameter is, is it's not time, it would look like the bottom plot, all right? And so those have the same frequency as a function of sine of elevation angle. Um, but they're on different parts of the soil. So that's another thing. So now I've shown, so this is pink, magenta, and black. Magenta and black, remember it was between hours two and three and hours and seven and eight. And they're both elevation angles like of five to 30 degrees. But you see here, azimuth angle, one is at about 180 degrees and the other one's between 45 and 50. And that's because one's over here and one's down here because it rises it rises and sets in a different place, right? It rises here and it sets here. That's just one satellite track. That satellite can come back 
for another Ryzen set. And then as Felipe said, there's 31 satellites, 32 satellites. There's three frequencies in GPS. And then the same can you can do the same game with GLONASS, Galileo. So you can get tons of satellites. And these are again reflection points for the um uh this is like uh you know Colorado latitudes um and for a satellite, excuse me, for a antenna that's about two meters above the ground. So again, where are the things stored? Well, we try to put everything in a directory called reflection code, but if it's SNR data, it's in a subdirectory called SNR. If they're results of the data analysis, they go in a directory called results. For the people that are going to be here tomorrow to learn about soil moisture, those results are stored in phase. Um, there's an input directory, there's a you know file directory, things like that. Um, we have tried to make sure that we don't expect you to memorize all this. The outputs of files are almost always printed to the screen so that you don't have to remember that. So Quick Look is a just, just a first glance, what's in my data file? You know, it's fine to translate a file, but there's nothing visual about it. So what it does is it says, I'm going to take each quadrant around my antenna, the northwest, the northeast, the southwest, and the southeast. And I'm just going to, using some defaults, look at what kind of periodic signals are in those quadrants. OK? So it's going to take apart each rising and setting arc. It's going to compute a periodogram. It's going to try to figure out what the dominant reflector height is using some defaults. And it's also going to use some quality control metrics. Um, problems with the way I've set things up, and I'm going to admit this is, just want you to notice these, see these small arcs here? Starts it at five degrees, gets to about six or seven degrees elevation. That's tiny, and I don't like that arc. It's not going to be very representative of the larger uh, field, and it's also not going to be a very good periodogram because I have so few data points. Um, even these other ones are not very good. The other problem is these ones that cross boundaries between, say, different quadrants are a problem. So what's going to come out of that SNR data is some kind of periodogram. And as Felipe was saying, the x-axis is going to be reflector height, because that's what we're trying to measure. Now, the reflector height, our peak, is right there. So whatever the most significant peak is, that's our reflector height. Whether we think it's a reliable one, that's the job of the quality control, because the quality control has to tell us whether we believe it. And we have two metrics. The one that's the least value is the amplitude one, which says, well, the peak has to be bigger than, say, 15 or 10 or 5. That's a dangerous way to play the game. We have it there. It's helpful. But the main one we use is, is the peak larger than the background noise values? So. The noise being nothing. So is your peak two times bigger than noise, three times? That's the kind of thing that is more valuable. We don't have a fancy one, though. It's not super complicated. It could be improved. But that's what we're using now. We say, is the peak bigger than, say, three times the noise, four times the noise? Um, why isn't there a special number for quality control? Um, you know, it's complicated. Um, the surfaces have different uh, reflectance characteristics. Like Felipe said, water is different than snow, which is different than soil. And different um, people use different strategies, which could give you bigger amplitudes, but which aren't necessarily high quality. Um, there's also one case that I'll show you an example of that I really, I hate the data. And using an amplitude criterion, for example, helps you get rid of those data. And so from that perspective, it's useful. Um, and I will admit that when we were running the network that we called PBOH2O, every single receiver was the same, and they were all about two meters tall. So we didn't spend as much time worrying about this as I do now, because now we're working on it with every kind of receiver there is. We don't discriminate. We don't have a favorite. We try to analyze them all. Um, and also tides are more interesting or 
complicated than um, PBOH 2 o where everything was two meters tall. Now we're trying to do uh, something that changes during the track. So some issues, I just want to make this clear. Uh, if you have this data set, which is all the data between 5 and 30 degrees, and you use all of it, you're going to get a different periodogram than if you only use 5 to 15 degrees, period. Just remember that. And, and this is what they actually look like. This is on the right is when you used only data between 5 and 15, and the other one's 5 to 25. I mean, you get a sharper peak, right? Well, that makes sense if you've had time series analysis. So don't you know, confuse yourself to say, oh, this one's better than the other one. Well, sometimes you have to use five to 15 because if you don't, you're not measuring the right thing. For example, with tides, sometimes going all the way up to 25 degrees means you're measuring soil and water at the same time. And that's not what you wanna do. Um, here's another one where if you just say peak to noise and you say you want the noise to go all the way out to 20 meters, well, now you've made your denominator much, much, much smaller. So your peak to noise gets, wait, is that right? But you know what I mean. Now you've, you've averaged in a lot of extra noise. That's not the same thing as noise that's been computed for six meters. Okay, so when you change your reflector height region, you can trick yourself by, if you don't remember that. And then this is uh, some examples I put together for amplitudes. So you recognize that what Felipe told you is absolutely what you're gonna see. Uh, this is bare soil. The amplitudes of those periodograms are about, I don't know, 12 to 15. And over here, they're 25, 20 to 25. The difference is this is bare soil and this is an ice sheet, okay? Um, there they are. Those are the actual um, sites. Um, another example would be for a site in Greenland that the Danish Technical uh, University runs. Uh, here are some tides measured or distributed by the IOC website. And so it's, it's going to be measuring the water surface here. Um, these are some periodograms I computed. So the reflector heights are about 20 meters because it's quite tall above that harbor. And you can see here in September, the amplitudes are about 10, whereas in January, they're about 25. Why are these things not in one place? Like here, they're, this is soil and they're in the same place. Well, soil doesn't move during the day. Tides move during the day. So when you see these periodograms moving, that's because you're measuring tides. And in September, it's water. And in January, it's ice. Okay. So just be aware that, you know, this is a this is a technique that can sense what kind of surface it is, as well as how tall the surface is with respect to the antenna. Um, what I forgot to tell you, and I guess I so I apologize, why so many colors? I don't know, I just like colors. So every satellite's a different color. I didn't want them to all be blue or all be red. So every color just means it's a different satellite. It's the periodogram for a single satellite track, single rising or setting satellite track. What are these gray things? Those are failed reflections. Why are they failed? Well, sometimes it's because they're crossing in between quadrants. Sometimes it's because there was only two degrees of elevation angle change and, and so on. Sometimes it's because the amplitudes are too small. Perhaps I had set a 10, a limit of 10 and this amplitude was seven, something like that. So the grays are there so that you have some sense of what a failed track is. So I'm gonna run the code for a simple site and it's the same site in fact that Felipe showed you, it's in Colorado. It's 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 flat, <laughs> that's why we like it. So again, these gray things, well, you see this, this periodogram is completely flat. It probably only had five points of data in it. There wasn't enough data to compute a, a frequency and thus you have no good reflector height. Sim similarly for this incredibly wide, tra wide uh, periodogram, probably wasn't very much data. 
but you see some good strong peaks the rest of the time in all four quadrants. Um, quick look if you run it um, before this class began is going to put out a summary. Azimuth going to be on the x axis. Um, the peak amplitude, so how tall that peak is, goes on the bottom. Peak to noise is in the middle, and that's usually set from three to four. And then the reflector height shown in um, on the top, and the red isn't usually there, but I'm showing you for a, for some place that's really flat, excuse me, those should be all lined up. And they're lined up at about two meters. Blue is good, gray is bad. But you can see here that there's this bad region around 90 degrees and a bad region about 270. And I'm gonna to try to convince you that that has nothing to do with reflectometry really. It's, it's a function of how I've coded it up and that I don't like tracks that cross quadrants. Um, and it's also because of the satellite inclination a little bit, but not completely. But basically it looks like what we picked as our, our default metrics are pretty good because we have a lot of good strong um, retrievals. On the command line, you can change uh, the frequency you look at. The default is L1, this is L2C. I like it even more than L1. Again, what causes these? Well, what causes them are these satellite tracks that cross the quadrants, or these tracks are very low. They don't reach very high in the, squat, in the sky. Same over here as well. Um, if you want to look at GLONASS data, you want to make sure that you've uh, used GLONASS orbits. So for example, I didn't do that when I first made the file, so I want to redo it. I have to say override is true. Um, after 2021, you can use the uh, rapid GNSS orbits. Uh, GLONASS data are great. They're not as beautiful as L2C and L5, but they're pretty nice. Um, you can change what reflector height, change, uh, sorry, the range of the reflector heights. In this case, I've set it to be 20 meters. Um, now I wanted to sort of kind of move into a, a more uh, interesting case. I was just showing you a flat field. It's perfect for snow, it's perfect for soil moisture, um, but water is, trickier. You almost never have reflections in all directions. Uh, this is uh, one of the Great Lakes. And if you had used the defaults from the original um, code, was from up to six meters, you do get some, um, you know, colors claiming that it's a successful retrieval, but you'll see they're down here at about a half of a meter which uh, from the picture is not what it looked like. Um, sorry. You know, the water doesn't look a half meter from the antennas here on the building. Well, change your heights. And in this case, I'm going from two meters to eight meters. There's a nice peak at about six and a half meters. And it's only showing up really in the south. It's not showing up in the Northwest at all. You see these gray regions here. So this is what the uh, the mask looks like. And now you're seeing something that the bad retrievals are really telling you something. The good retrievals are right here along these azimuths, and then it falls apart because it should fall apart. These, I'd say they're a little bit marginal because of some problems at the site, but also because, again, they're around 90 degrees. Um, this is what happens when you use old equipment. Uh, this receiver is incredibly old and it's not using L2C. And unlike these retrievals where it's, well, sorry, I'd have to go back. These retrievals were showing you what? Retrievals of like 12, 15, nice strong retrievals. Uh, these are instead one or two in the units. And do you see how they have two peaks, two distinct peaks? And that's because of how the receiver is generating those um, phase data. 
I don't have time to talk about it now. There's nothing wrong with the way the receiver is doing its job. It just makes using those data more difficult. And I really discourage you from using um, these older signals. Um, okay. So I'm talking very fast, so I apologize for that. Um, so you've looked at the data, you kind of have an idea of where the good azimuths, uh, we haven't talked about the elevation angles, but I'll do that last. Um, you need to write down your strategy. You don't want to be typing it on the command line all the time. So uh, we have this code called make JSON input that has some defaults, which I will skip. But basically, um, you give it the lat long and height. The defaults are, in this case, it used to be, sorry, where is it? What it's doing is keeping track of all your choices. You can change your choices on the command line, but here I'm using the defaults at this time, 0 0.5 to 6 meters. Um, I was setting up the precision of the periodogram. I'm telling it to use all the GPS frequencies, which are defined as 1, 20, and 5. I'm telling it to use the four generic quadrants. Um, I'm not sure that I should talk about EDIF because I won't have enough time. What else? Here's the required amplitude. Here's the required peak to noise, that kind of thing. People ask me, can you, after you've made this file, can you edit it? Absolutely. Absolutely. You can change it. Let's skip this because we don't have enough time. For quality control, you don't have to have any amplitude. You can do it entirely with peak to noise, but just remember peak to noise varies by surface. So water surfaces are gonna be different than ice surfaces and their peak to noise values will also vary. Um, and I'll talk, I'm not gonna worry about this too much. Too much. Um, Simon's going to show you some examples on Thursday that are a little tricky. There are lots of command line um, inputs. You can change, for example, to say you want all frequencies. You don't want just GPS. With the data from Lake Michigan, you can say, I just want the L1 data because the L2 data has two peaks in it. Um, this would be the frequency list for GPS and GLONASS. You can change your height regions. You can change your azimuth regions and so on and so forth. Um, once you've run your data, it's going to put out a plain text file with the year, the day of year, and the reflector height. And then it's just going to have a bunch of extra information that you might need later on when you're trying to measure soil moisture, snow depth, or tides. And it'll have identifying data like which frequency is it? Um, what azimuth is it, and things like that. What time was it? You, you generally don't care that much what time it was if you're trying to measure snow, but you know if you're trying to measure tides, that's exactly what you need to know. Um, another thing that people for, um, don't usually see when they're looking at the documentation, if you don't know why the code's not producing good results, you can try setting the screen stats to true. It'll try to tell you why I rejected that. Um, and there are other things that you should know. We don't let arcs cross midnight. Um, and there are some reasons for that. But we're going to think about how to fix that. Can you change the strategy on the command line? Sort of, but I don't encourage you to do that. But the command line does say, look, do the entire year of 2020. or for example, do two years all or three years, all of 2015, all of 2016, all of 2017. After you've translated your data, you've picked your target and you've analyzed the data, then you make products and that's what tomorrow and the next day are about. So I'm gonna not talk about that now, uh, but talk to you about some other things in the code so reflection zones in particular and other utilities you might not know about. So let me talk to you about reflection zones. Felipe got you started um, by showing you that he told you what a Fresnel zone was and you know what it would look like and what drives that. So 
I'm just going to show you on the web. Can someone confirm that you can see my um, um, I can see my your browser? I can see it. Perfect. Okay, so this is the reflection zone mapping tool. I'm going to put Lake Michigan in there. That's the one that we were talking to you about. The reflector height there was about 6.5 meters. Now I have this database that I stole from the University of Nevada. So I just, I can just put the station name in. I'm gonna start with L1 and I'm gonna look at elevation angles of five, 10 and 15. And I'm gonna start out, oh, you know what? I think this is gonna give me snow, but let's look at it. Oh no, that's okay. Interesting. I haven't looked at this one in a while. Um, and it shows you, that doesn't even look right, but let's assume it is. What am I getting it mixed up with? Oh, I'm getting it mixed up with Ross, I guess. Anyway, um, I hope you can see that there are ellipses here in yellow that are on soil, and then there are other yellow ellipses which are on water, and then there are blue ellipses and red ellipses, and those are, in this case, five degree elevation angle, 10 degrees, and 15. Well, I want to measure this lake, so I don't want any of these. So what you should do is go back and say, look, Michigan, I still want that lake, and I still want 6.5 meters, still want L1, but now I, I'm going to try going from 70 to, I don't know, 120, something like, no, no, sorry, apologize. I can't remember now. Apologies in advance. Okay a lot better. Now, I still have this over here I should cut out. So you want to re go back, because I was careless, and put in, say, 90 or 100. And you might be able to get over here, too. Okay, that's not too bad. And you might even be able to use higher elevation angles than that. Let me show you one uh, that is uh, it's kind of a cute Place. Now I'm going to use AT01. I know that it's on the coast, not an interior lake. So I'm going to use mean sea level. I'm going to use L1. I'm still going to use 5, 10, 15 because it's um it's uh because it's water. And what you see is a site on a peninsula. Here's the picture. It's right there. And you can see that. For these azimuths to the northwest, you're on soil. And these azimuths over here, you're on water, at least as far as we can tell. And the reflector height is given to you because it knows the height of the antenna. It makes um, a correction for the geoid and it's 12.3 meters. So let's go back and try to cut it up a little bit better, AT01. Let's use mean sea level, use L1. Let's, let's I think we can use up to zero. Let's let's do that. There we go. Okay. That's pretty sweet. Now there may be, I shouldn't go this far, right? I went to 240, maybe I should do 230. But this says that you should be able to get a good water level retrieval from about zero, say to about 230, 220, 5, 10, 15 degrees at this particular site. Now, is it true? Let's give it a, let's, let's try. Let's put in a number. This is very scary. I shouldn't do this. I have everything just in screenshots. Um, let's put on all the GPS. Now, remember the maximum reflector height was like, it was, uh, <clears throat> it was about 12. That was the mean sea level. So let's put in 15 there. Now let's not put our mask on yet to see what comes out. Let's see what happens there. All right. <clears throat> so this is basically your code, um, but as a web app. So it has some nice features so that you can see results right away. Um, it doesn't do the reflection zone mapping. That's a separate, you know, you should use this tab here up at the top. So what it does is it goes and gets the data, hopefully. Ah, look, it's so cool. Anyway, um, I just want to point out a few things to you. First of all, it's finding two peaks, one here at 2.5 and one here at about 12. 
Well, that's because it's seeing the soil over here on the peninsula. So if we tell it, no, 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 I don't want to measure soil, I'm measuring tides. If you tell it to start at five, then that's going to give you much better results. So let me do that. Let me um, go up here on the screen and just put in a five and do it again. Now, this is not, I, mean, I don't encourage you to spend all your days doing this on my web app, but um, it's a nice little demo tool to uh, get you started. So hopefully this time it'll um, cut out the, oh, I didn't take out the other azimuths. Darn it, darn it. This is why you shouldn't do things without preparing. But anyway, it's still going to have the other azimuths, but we don't need those other azimuths because we're pretty sure they, they aren't good. But let's check it out. It's so slow. It shouldn't be this slow. So maybe I've done something wrong. H1 equals 5, H2 equals 15. I don't know why it's so slow. All right, so let me show you something else while we wait for this. Um, documentation. Let's show you documentation. Um, what do you need to know? Quick links. Uh, basically, if you want to know any of the inputs to, say, GNSSIR, for example, there will be some sample runs, but also all the inputs so that you can run it. Um, helper codes, for example, um, David Purnell is going to talk about inverse SNR. The helper code is inverse SNR input, make JSON input you've already seen. Let's say you want to compare to tide gauges. We have some code that will do that called download tides. It reads the NOAA tide gauges and the IOC tide gauges. And then there's some other utilities like you can't remember what, you know, today's May 2nd, what day of year that is. You can just type year, month, day into your screen and it'll tell you. So here, actually here came the results. Now I screwed up because I told it to take all azimuths when I should have said zero to 240. But you can see these are actually the tides for that for that site. Um, those nice peaks at about 12 meters. Um, web app, if we have time, other utilities you might not realize are there. Reflection zone utilities, we went over that a little bit. Um, I'm trying to think, is there anything else you can use on this? So the reflection zones are here. If we have different, I have some different uh, values you can use, 5 to 25, 5 to 15, 5 to 12, 5 to 7, and so forth. You can set different uh, um, azimuth angles. Um, I don't think it's particularly helpful, but you could, for example, I just wanted to tell you, you can use negative azimuth angles if you have northern quadrants you want to look at. Um, Felipe also talked about the Nyquist. So let me think, how can I show you the importance of the Nyquist? Let me see, I'll be teaching to you, I guess. Um, let's see if that one works. And let's say the reflective height is 12. And let's say you wanna use 30 seconds and we'll compute the Nyquist. Um, so this is a site you know, in a German river, and what it does is it tells you, and Felipe is right, it's not telling you how to estimate reflector height, it's telling you what sampling interval you should use for your receiver to measure this thing that I told it has a reflector height of 12 meters. Now, I just know that because it's um, a site I've used. Do you see down here, the blue is L1 and the red is L2 and the cyan is L5? This tells you that the Nyquist is at about 12 meters. It's at the worst possible place. You can't use 30 second data to measure this site reliably with GNSSIR. You need, at least in this, at this site, you need 50, 15 second data. And this is 30 second data. 
so I won't show you the examples of what aliasing looks like, but basically the L1 retrievals will be unreliable. If you're interested in measuring soil moisture or snow, and you know your antenna's two meters tall, none of this should matter to you. 30 seconds is fine. Um, I have another site I can show you that looks perfectly fine. I'm trying to remember, what's it called? Uh, this one is my new favorite. I think it's, but it's 30 second data. It's in Australia. Um, but it, the mean sea level is less than 10 meters. So it's far enough away from the Nyquist that you can use the 30 second data. And in this case, I've set it up so it plots the tides for you. I mean, it, instead of looking at the quality control, it shows you hour of day and gives you a relatively immediate um, uh, retrieval. So the person who asked, do I do one centimeter um, uh, tight gauge? No, I don't. I, I think that uh, David Purnell is going to talk to you about a really nice uh, method that comes close to achieving those kinds of uh, precisions. But it's smoothing. You're making assumptions when you do that. And um, when we do these peri the periodic gram approach, we really aren't making any smoothing assumptions at all. We're looking at the frequency while the satellite is rising or setting caused by the reflection from the surface. And we do have to make a correction for that uh, surface um, motion, but that's about it. So this is a, a pretty famous GNSSIR site called Friday Harbor. There's a NOAA tide gauge um, located here. And David and Simon Williams are going to talk about using this site on Thursday. Um, but um, in this case, this is all three major constellations, GPS, um, GLONASS, and Galileo. So I think I've done that without looking at all at whether anybody's saying anything. So I'm going to say stop the share and try to take some questions if uh, Tim would read them to me or somebody reads them to me. Christine, we've been answering a lot of them, I think, in real time, but there were a number of questions about asking about the quadrants so, or why you don't allow crossing quadrants. So I might be good to review that again, just because there were so many of them. Um, to be honest, at the beginning, it was just laziness, and it was easy to set things up in 90-degree quadrants. And uh, because I had done this for hundreds of sites in the Western US, I knew that most satellite tracks only cross a quadrant once. So it was simply an easy thing to code up. Um, I think it should be abandoned. And um, I think that's what we're gonna do. What we're gonna do, Felipe's I think already provided some code to me is we'll just go in there and figure out the rising and setting arcs another way that don't have that problem. So I think it's an issue that will go away, but uh, right now, uh, we currently ask you to set up smaller quadrants, not tiny quadrants, but you know, of about 70 to 90 degrees. And if you wanna look at the entire uh, area, we ask that you say zero to 90, 90 to 180, 180 to 270, 270 to 360. But there's nothing um, really profound about that. It was really more that we already had code that did that from before. And uh, so it was easy to, to set it up that way, but it's not a requirement in the future, I think is the answer. Yeah, and then I think otherwise, Christine, we'll we're keep chipping away at these. And Melissa said she will preserve all these questions so we can continue to address any or uh, that haven't been answered. So unless you'd think, like to, go ahead. I mean, are, is, is Slack going away? Uh, not for at least a few weeks, so. Well, I mean, okay. Um, I, I, if you guys want to answer those, that's fine with me. I'm not, I'm not going to look on the, the screen because I don't know how to look at it. <laughs> 
I mean, once this Zoom is over, I don't know how to get those questions is what I'm saying. Yes, and I'm just letting you know that Melissa said that we will, she she will uh, allow us to, she'll preserve those so we can continue to. Okay. Um, I think the one thing to, to remind everybody, though, is that um, specific things about snow and soil moisture can be asked tomorrow and water levels on Thursday and uh, things like that. There were a lot of questions this morning about antennas and uh, can you do this with uh, GNSSIR and that. And a lot of those are answered in the papers that are on our website as well. And uh, so people are welcome to read those as well because some of the questions will be answered there as well. Um, so there are different ways to find out the answers and we'll try to answer them here. But if we don't answer things that you've asked, you can also look in some of those publications. Is that sort of it? Am I supposed to say something? <laughs> I guess I can. All right, well, if no one tells me I can't, that's two minutes before the end of the uh, session. So um, tomorrow we're going to cover snow in the first hour and soil moisture in the second. Uh, I just want to warn the soil moisture people, though, I can't measure soil moisture if there's snow on the ground. So <laughs> if you're expecting miracles, I can't do that. But in some ways, knowing if there's snow on the ground, it's useful if you show up for the first hour because it is going to tell you something about how you can trust your soil moisture in the second hour. And, um, you know, one of the things you do when you measure soil moisture is you measure the reflector height. So you have an ax a way to measure snow right there. Um, for sea level and tides and so on, it's a bit more complicated. And so I just encourage you to come on Thursday to learn the tricks of the trade there. And we're going to have David and Simon William, both experts in using uh, GNSSI to measure water levels, talking there. And then on Friday, we're going to have a guest talk about installing one of these sites to measure tides in Greenland. And so he actually has just recently gone through this process of how do you do this for a new site? You know, what are the questions you should ask yourself? Um, okay. All right, so I will see you guys tomorrow at the same time, and I hope the whole link thing issue is gone away. <laughs>